Hey everyone, welcome back to Realms Remembered. This is Michael T. Bradley. It is July 26th, 2014 today. We're going to kind of zoom through quite a few books here today. I don't know what's up. I just haven't seen, nothing really seems to be clicking with me. And I'll tell you why as we go through that seems odd. Because the stuff that we're covering isn't anything bad. And it's stuff that I'd kind of been looking forward to. Uh, yet, for some reason, uh, it's just not doing much for me. And I don't know if that's because the Twilight War trilogy just really spoiled me. Or if it's just that I'm in the mood for something different right now. It doesn't feel that way. I don't know what it is. I, um, you know, I, I want to blame it on some sort of like, uh, what's it, what's it called? Uh, the Wesserschmalt, some sort of, you know, uh, uh, underlying malaise that was behind all the writers at this point because fourth edition was coming up. But that can't be the case because I've liked some of the stuff that obviously happened while they were talking about fourth edition happening. Let's quickly move through a couple of anthologies, Realms of Mystery. Uh, this book was kind of, I almost gave up on it because I just wasn't liking anything in it. And then for some reason, at about the halfway point, I start liking the stuff that's in there. I'm just going to point out the stories that I liked. Uh, Richard Lee Byers has a fun little mystery story, H. That's that's another thing about this. Most of these aren't really mystery stories, and so that was kind of frustrating. Keith Francis Strom actually had a story that I decently enjoyed, Strange Bedfellows. J. Robert King, When's the Song of Steel? I, I think I remember really liking that, which shocked me because I was never a J. Robert King fan when he worked in Magic. But again, uh, you know, I like Keith Francis Strom in here. I like Brian Thompson in here. And uh, he has the next story in here, An Unusual Suspect, which is not as good as the first one about this character, but it's still good. And, and, and so my point there that I started to make was just that it goes to show you that sometimes people can be really great short story writers and not great novelists and vice versa. Then uh, Thomas M. Reed had uh, Linnaela, Linnaela, however you pronounce that, and that was pretty decent. That was also a mystery, and so that was pretty cool. There were a few in there that I really liked. I was sad because I was kind of excited about the idea of uh, a mystery anthology because I think the realms could be a really good place to do some crazy inventive mysteries. And um, a couple of them were decent, but they weren't anything that really blew me away. And I was very, very sad that Chet Williamson did not contribute something since he wrote uh, uh, whatever the first one was, Murder in Halrua, maybe, uh, Murder in Cormier, Tether, whatever the first one was. He wrote that one, and I loved it so much. So I was hoping that he had perhaps a short story in here, and he did not. Now let's move on to Realms of the Deep. I was going to cover this next time, but I'd already finished it, and uh, the reason for that is because I skipped all but three stories. It was just more of the kind of stuff that we had seen in um, uh, the Mel Autumn trilogy. Uh, what was it? Uh, the Rising Tide or something like that? It just... It, nothing here really excited me. It was all kind of like the Sahag one attack. That was overall the plot of every single story. The three that I liked, Richard Lee Byers had a story called Lost Cause that I really enjoyed. Troy Denning had a simply incredible story in here. Uh, the Crystal Reef, just utterly sad and frustrating and really, really good. Uh, Denning, man, when he hits it out of the park, he hits it out of the park. And also liked a um, uh, another story from Keith Francis Strom. It's the last one in here. It's called something like And Also the Dark Tide, something like that. It wasn't the best thing I've ever read, but it, it was it was good. It was solid, and honestly, just most of those stories, I couldn't keep reading past a page or two. They were just, you know, it was like, Bob woke up from sleep. There was somebody attacking. Oh, my God, it was Sahagwa, and he fought them. And, and maybe something, twists happened along the way, but that's really how they all started, and it felt like this isn't anything new, guys. Come on. So let's go ahead and finish off a couple of series. Uh, first, let's finish off the Dungeon series. Pretty sure this is the last one. The Depths of Madness by Eric Scott DeBee. I was uh, really looking forward to this because I had uh, enjoyed DeBee's earlier thing that we read. Uh, what was it? Ghost, Ghost Walker, I think. And, and I thought it showed a lot of promise. And I thought, oh, this is going uh, to... He, he's going to really grow as a writer. And I had heard this was essentially Saw in the realms. So I was very curious about that. I mean, it's far more Saw 2 or that, we, that stupid CBS miniseries. It's not person of interest, but it's like people, unknown persons or something like that. It only lasted one season, and I don't think they ever answered any of the mysteries. But, in any case, I read this with a lot of excitement, and it just never amounted to anything, which was frustrating because, you know, normally 
I, I'm sure I've said this before and many other people have, it, it's much easier to write a bad review of something because you have so many things to talk about. But in this, I was like, okay, our party is, I, I think it was six or seven really diverse characters with interesting backgrounds and pretty well-defined personalities but nothing clicked for me. I just couldn't find any of them interesting enough to hold on to. You could tell that Debbie, at least, really, really, really loved his Fox at Twilight character. And I'm like, uh, you know, I, I don't have any problem with her, but I don't find her interesting. I find her kind of Mary Sue-ish and just... It seems so much like, guys, guys, look what I'm doing in the realms. It didn't feel like... I, I didn't feel like there was much there for me to care about, but I, I, I enjoyed probably four, at, at least, of the characters in the party, but I was kind of like, okay, so this is supposed to be a Saw thing. Here's who's going to die first, and here's who's going to die second, and that's what happened, and I was like, okay, and there's going to be a twist at the end, so my bets are on this person actually being an emissary of the evil overlord, and I was right. It just felt like... You know, there, there, there's this kind of thing where if you take something and transplant it into the realms, if you do it too by the numbers, then you just wind up with something that feels like a bad ripoff of Saw 2 rather than an inventive way to put something into the realms. So, it, 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 it's as I say, it's difficult because there's, there's nothing... The writing here is solid. The characters are really well-rounded. And I didn't enjoy it at all. <laughs> you know, it's like... I, so I, I, I can't put my finger on why not, and I can't say that there's any sort of reason for it. And honestly, I would recommend the book, because I'm like, maybe I was just having a bad week, I don't know, but it just did not grip me at all. Still, however, because of a lot of the strengths that were there, I am still yet looking forward to more from Debbie. Uh, he He's active in 4th edition, so I'm, I'm looking forward to that. I mean, I haven't lost my faith in Debbie at this point at all. Finishing out the Citadels, Shield of Weeping Ghosts by James P. Davis. Now, this I had actually picked up, like, God, five or six, maybe even seven years ago now from the library and tried it out, and I just didn't dig it at all. And I've got to say, I did not finish this one either, but I got a lot farther than I did when I picked it up before. I think my main issue is that I kept getting terms confused, and at one point I was just like, wait, I don't even know why... These characters are where they are, or what they're doing, and I was like, I wasn't sure if this was happening because I was reading lazily, or if it was because Davis wasn't setting things up properly, but for whatever reason, it just didn't gel with me. But it's not bad. It kind of reminded me a lot of uh, Book 5 of the Malazan series, because just suddenly you have these characters who, I swear we've had the Rashomon folk uh, come into play somewhere before, but I can't remember where, and I obviously didn't remember anything about their society, because there were all these terms being thrown around, and I'm like, what the hell are they talking about? But early on in Book 5 of the uh, Malazan series, of uh, uh, this group of three from this race that we've really not seen much of before that point are out in the snow hunting things and using all these terms that just haven't been used before because Book 5 happens years before Book 1 and on a different continent than anything we've seen so far. And, and so it, it felt a lot like that, and it just wasn't... Either it wasn't strong enough or I wasn't awake enough to keep up with stuff, and I realized I'm about 20% of the way through this book and I don't know what the hell is going on. Like, one guy is exiled from his tribe... And I wasn't, I, I didn't know why, and maybe it hadn't been revealed yet, but it was like, he was somehow kind of leading the search party. Like, it was like he, in exile, he was thrown to search this citadel, maybe? I don't know. I I just could not keep up with it. And it, it seems like something about Davis's style just does not agree with my brainwaves, and that's, you know, that's a thing that happens now and then. So if anybody has read it, let me know. Also, the, I think it starts out with Dead Kids, which, you know... That's a keeper right there, right? So, uh, yeah. And the last thing that we'll cover today is, um, moving back to Year of Risen Elfkin in 1375 now, uh, Shield of Weeping Ghosts is 1376. Moving back to 1375, because I thought I might have a little bit more to say about this, The Last of the Watercourse Trilogy, Scream of Stone by Philip Athens. Again, I don't know if I'm just in a funk right now. I've been having some health issues, but I am still enjoying some books. But for whatever reason... You guys remember how excited I was for the first two, and then reading this one was just kind of like, 
oh man, when is this gonna end? You know, I was just like, does the canal get built or not, for God's sake? That's really all I care about at this point. And uh, the story just kind of unspools more. It really felt more as if everything in book three could have just kind of been three extra chapters tacked on to book two. I didn't feel like there was enough action in here to warrant an entire book. And um, again, the action scenes are always really odd in this trilogy because they feel so jammed into this, like, deep, philosophical, and Randian meandering about sense of self and accomplishment and blah, 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 blah. And it's like, you know, Willem's a zombie now, but he's not really a zombie. I don't know what the hell he's supposed to be. I'm, I'm assuming it's something that's real from a monster's manual somewhere. And he's just, you know, it's like the whole, it kind of reminds me of a, uh, it almost reminds me of book, I think it was book six of Harry Potter where Draco kept trying to kill Harry. And, you know, in that book, nobody would believe Harry, even though people have been trying to kill him for five friggin' years now. So it seems stupid, but it's like nobody believed him. And so it just kept happening. And here it's more like Willem just keeps at the last minute being like, no and running away and smashing other people's heads in. And it's like, for God's sake, dude, just piss or get off the pot. You know what I mean? Like, that's that's really what it felt like for the whole damn story. Even the ending, there's no closure because the Scream of Stone, the title, applies to charges being set at the canal site. The place is blown up and and basically everything that they've accomplished in these, like, God, what now, 25 years or something is destroyed and it's the Scream of Stone because they're all exploding. So it's like, okay, it didn't get finished. That sucks, but at least I know now. But then the, essentially the epilogue is, is them being like, we're gonna rebuild. We're gonna, we're gonna make this bitch. And I remember that Ivar Deverast is mentioned in the fourth edition manual, but I purposefully kind of like, uh, when I saw his name, skittered my eyes away because I was like, I don't want to know how it ends. So I, I, I don't know if they actually rebuild it or not. You know, I and my fourth edition manual got lost in the mail when I moved a little over a year ago, so I can't go look it up now. See if the library has one of those. Maybe maybe I can look it up there. So, yeah, as of the end of the series, it's like, did they get the canal finished? Who knows? Maybe. <laughs> there is at least some fun stuff with Merrick. I have to admit, though, one thing that puzzles me. I've seen different people post in reviews and forums and so forth that Merrick is either gay or at least bi. And I didn't pick that up from the series. And I'm, I'm just kind of curious, does anybody remember anything specific about that? Because the only thing that I caught was that Merrick at one point looking at Willem and what he's become and what he's turned him into and how pathetic he is and how he's not human anymore. He thinks something like, oh, well, I could have loved you at one point, but not anymore. And... To me, it seemed like because he's his patron, it, it didn't feel like a romantic interest to me. And so maybe I'm just blind and I'm missing it. And, you know, obviously I'm cool if he was gay or bi. Like, I'm not saying that, you know, not one of those people who's like, just don't put it in my fantasy fiction, damn it, that's, that's my last, you know. I'm like, I want more. I want trans characters, I want gay, bi characters, I want everything in here. Because, uh, why not, you know? But I, I'm, I'm just curious because I didn't see it. Am I just blind? I, I do have, what would you call it? White, cis, male gaze or whatever <laughs> it would be. Like, you know, when I read the first Malazan book, there are two characters who are very obviously dark skinned and I didn't pick up on this. And then I started looking at fan art because I wanted to, because there's so many characters, I needed like artwork to help me kind of keep them disparate in my mind. And and everybody kept doing pictures of Quick Ben and Kalam as as African Americans, and I was like, well, that's cool, but what an odd choice to randomly decide that they're dark skinned. And then when I reread the first book, it's like every other goddamn paragraph is like his ebony skin blended with the night, and blah 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 blah. And I'm like, oh wow, I just completely glazed over this because I'm a straight white cis male, you know? So. I'm curious, was there really obvious stuff that I missed? Because honestly, it happens. I sure as hell noticed the poly ending <laughs> in uh, Return of the Archwizards. So I'm, I'm not completely blind, but yeah, I uh, didn't see that. So yeah, that's really all I have for today. I've, I've said a lot more than I planned to, and all of it was really rambling and inconsequential because, I, I mean, just really nothing's happening here. We are getting to the point, though, 
where we're about ready to finish up third edition. And so I'm excited to talk about how everything gels together. And if I have one of these where I actually don't blather on for 15 plus minutes, then I'll kind of try to fit that in because there's really no easy way to do it. So next time we are going to try to conquer the double diamond triangle saga, which will be exciting. Yeah. All right. For now, this is Michael T. Bradley, Realms Remembered.